Rock and Larry lock in with the Palladian Light Grid Project with a special report. Um, today I'm going to discuss the case of Leonard Peltier, a Native American who I believe was falsely accused of falsely accused and convicted of murdering two FBI agents in 1977 where he was sentenced to two life terms. Um, before I get started on that, and I'm also going to touch on towards the end, I'm going to talk touch on the corruptness in our um, prison system here in the United States with a lot of these prisons being privatized and whatnot and you know the way some of these prisoners are treated it's just really inhumane and it needs to be brought to the attention of the public but and also before I get started I want to give a shout out to a very special Facebook group called Wind Horse Circle of Rainbow Warriors and two great admins that they have on their team uh, Greg Stout and Cheryl Engel Rainbows much love to you two and much love to all the other admins in that group and the members of that group. But I'm going to start off with giving a little bit of background on Leonard Peltier. Um, he was born on September 12th, 1944. Um, he was al He's also a Native American activist and was a member of the American Indian Movement known as AIM. And of course, like I had mentioned before, in 1977, he was convicted of murdering or shooting and murdering those two FBI agents on the Pine Indian. Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota here in the United States. Um, over the years, Peltier's indictment has received uh, lots of controversy. Uh, in fact, Amnesty International placed his case under the unfair trials category of its annual report in the USA 2010 edition. Um, he's currently incarcerated as we speak at the United States Penitentiary Coleman in Florida. His next parole hearing is not scheduled till 2024. Now keep in mind the man is already 71 years old and has already been through hell and the injustice done to this man could never ever be taken back. No amount of money could ever take back what this man has went through. Um, they have, This is funny, they had his projected release date of October 11th, 2040. Like, gee, that's, that's mighty white of them. Um, some things about him before we get into the case, really. Um, of course, he was born in Grand Forks, North Dakota, the 11th of 13 children of Leo Peltier and Alvina Rabadou. Um, his father was a Turtle Mountain Chippewa, on his parental on his paternal side and French on his maternal side. His mother was a South Dakota Sioux, French on her mother's side and Chippewa on her father's. Now, you know, that's I don't know really what the French has to play with it. But um, he divorced when his parents the, his parents divorced when he was four years old. Um he, he was taken to live with his grandparents in the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa near Belcourt, North Dakota. Okay, so it, it, he went on, he graduated high school in 1957. Um, actually, it says he dropped out in the ninth grade before he returned to the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation. Um, okay, some of the things that he had done previously, previously to his release, um, he relocated to Seattle, Washington in 1965, worked for years as the owner of an auto body station. Uh, he became involved in a variety of civil rights causes championing Native American rights and eventually joined the American Indian Movement, AIM. Um, in the early 70s, he was made aware about the factional tensions at the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. Uh, between supporters Richard Wilson, elected tribal chairman in 1972, and the traditional members of the tribe. Wilson had created a private militia known as the Guardians of the Ogallala Nation. Um, within parentheses, they've got the letters Goon. Um, the members of this uh, militia were reputed to have attacked political opponents. Protests over a failed impeachment hearing of Wilson contributed to the AIM and Lakota armed takeover of Wounded Knee in February of 1973, which resulted in a 71-day siege by federal forces known as the Wounded Knee Incident. They demanded the resignation of Wilson. Peltier, however, spent most of the occupation in a Milwaukee jail charged with attempted murder. When Peltier secured bail at the end of April, he took part in an AIM protest outside the federal building in Milwaukee and on, was on his way to Wounded Knee with the group to deliver supplies when the incident ended. Um, the takeover did not end Wilson's leadership, the actions of the goons, or the violence. The Og Ogallala Sioux Tribe government recently asked U.S. Attorney Brendan Johnson to look at a 45 unresolved deaths since that time. 
In 75, Peltier traveled to the Pine Ridge Reservation as a member of AIM to try to help reduce the continuing violence among political opponents. At the time, he was a fugitive with a warrant issued in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It charged him with unlawful flight to avoid prosecution for the attempted murder of an off-duty Milwaukee police officer, a crime in which he was later acquitted. He was actually acquitted on that crime. Okay, so now we get into the meat of the subject of what went down. Okay, on June 26, 1975, Special Agents Jack Collier and Ronald A. Williams of the Federal Bureau Investigation, also known as the FBI, duh, were on the Pine Inn Re Indian Reservation, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, searching for a young man by the name of Jimmy Eagle, who was wanted for questioning in connection with a recent assault and robbery of two local ranch hands. Eagle had been involved in a physical altercation with a friend during which he had stolen a pair of leather cowboy boots. At approximately 11.50 a.m., Williams and Collier, driving two separate unmarked cars, spotted and reported and followed a red pickup truck, which matched the description of Eagles. Soon after the initial report, Williams radioed into a local dispatch that he and Collier had come under high-powered rifle fire from the occupants of that vehicle and were unable to return file fire with their 38 special revolvers. Williams radioed that they would be killed if reinforcements did not arrive. He next radioed that it was a hit. FBI Special Agent Gary Adams was the first to respond to Williams' call for assistance. And he also came under intense gunfire and was unable to reach Collier and Williams. The FBI and the BIA, which is the Bureau of Indian Land Management, and local police spent the afternoon waiting for other law enforcement officers. At 2.30 p.m., BIA rifleman, a BAI rifleman, BIA rifleman, sorry folks, fatally shot Joe Stuns, an AIM member who had taken part in the shootout. Um, at 4.31 p.m., authorities recovered the bodies of Williams and Collier from their vehicles. At 6.30 p.m., they ignited tear gas and stormed the Jumping Bull houses where they found the body of Native American Joseph Stunts. Stunts was clad in Collar's green FBI field jacket, which he appeared to have taken from the agent's car. The two FBI agents were later confirmed to have died on June 26, 1975. Stunts appeared to have died later during a subsequent shooting. Um, the FBI reported that Williams had received defensive wound a defensive wound to his right hand as he attempted to shield his face from a bullet which passed through his hand into his head, killing him instantly. Williams received two gunshot injuries to his body and foot prior to the contact shot that killed him. Um, Collier, in, incapacitated from earlier bullet wounds, had been shot twice in the head. In total, 125 bullets were found in the agent's vehicle, many from a 223 Remington, or 5.6 mm rifle. Um, Leonard Peltier provided numerous alibis to different people about his activities on that morning, um, the morning of the attacks in question. In an interview with Peter Matheson in Spirit of the Crazy Horse, 1983, uh, Peltier described working on a car in Ogallala, claiming to have driven back to Jumping Bull Compound about an hour before the shooting started. In an interview with Lee Hill, he described being woken up in a tent seti at the ranch by the sound of gunshots to Harvey Arden. He described, enjoy, he, he described enjoying a beautiful morning before he heard the firing. Um, on September 5, 1975, Agent Williams' 30, 38 Special Service revolver and shells from both agents' handguns were found in a vehicle near a residence where a gentleman by the name of Dino Butler was arrested. On September 9, 1975, Peltier purchased a Plymouth station wagon in Denver, Colorado. The FBI sent out descriptions of the vehicle and a recreational vehicle in which Peltier and his associates were believed to be traveling in. An Oregon State trooper stopped the vehicles and ordered the driver of the RV to exit, but after a brief exchange of gunfire, the driver escaped on foot. Authorities later identified the driver as Peltier. Agent Collier's 38 Special Service revolver was found in a bag under the front seat of the RV, where authorities later reported finding Peltier's thumbprint. Um, on September 10, 1975, a station wagon exploded on the Kansas Turnpike near Wichita. A burned AR-15 rifle was recovered, along with Agent Collier's 308 rifle. Uh, the car was loaded with weapons and explosives, which apparently 
ignited when placed too close to a hole in the exhaust pipe. Injured in the blast were Robert Robidoux, Norman Charles, and Michael Anderson, who were all members of AIM. On December 22, 1975, Peltier was named to the FBI's most wanted list, fugitives most wanted list. Peltier had fled to Hinton, Alberta in Canada, where he hid in a friend's cabin. Um, on February 6, 1976, he was arrested and extradited from Canada based on an affidavit signed by Myrtle Porbear, a local Native American. She had claimed to have been Peltier's girlfriend at the time and to have witnessed the murders. But according to Peltier and others at the scene, Porbear did not know Peltier, nor was she present at the time of the shooting. She later claimed that she was pressured and threatened by FBI agents into giving statements. Hmm, that's a real surprise. Um, that's not a surprise at all for me because that's how they strong arm people and that's how they talk down to people. And I can especially see in the 1970s how that would have been a real problem um, for anybody to come forward or to really tell the truth um, because the FBI is going to intimidate the answer out of you that they want you to hear. Um, Poor, she, she attempted to actually testify, Poor Bear actually attempted to testify about the FBI's intimidation at Peltier's trial. However, surprise, surprise, the judge barred her testimony on the grounds of mental incompetence. Meanwhile, Peltier fought extradition to Canada, even as Bob Robideau and Daryl Dino Butler, AIM members also present on the Jumping Bull compound at the time of the shootings, were not found guilty on the grounds of self-defense by a federal jury in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So, and then, and then what, what happens there is Peltier was returned too late to be tried with the two of them, and he was tried separately, being made to be the scapegoat, um, when really, you know, he was probably just as innocent and acting in self-defense, um, in my mind was, as Robert Owen Butler. Um, that really makes sense. So you acquit two of the three people on self-defense and because the other person wasn't able to be at the trial he hold the trial for him separately and then hang him out to dry of course the trial was held in fargo north dakota where a jury convicted peltier of the murders of collier and williams unlike the trial for butler and robito the jury was informed that two fbi agents were killed at close range um, co close range gunshots to their heads and they and claimed that they were defenseless due to their previous gunshot wounds. You know, of course, they can make up the story as they go. Um, they also saw um, autopsy and crime scene photographs of the two agents, which had not been shown to the jury at Cedar Rapids in April 77, or back when that happened with, during the Robido and Butler case. Uh, they had saw they had not seen autopsy and crime scene photographs of the two agents. Um, so in April of 77, of course, Leonard was convicted and sentenced to two consecutive life sentences. Um, upon hearing an appeals case, he had, did have an appeals case that was conducted on February 11th, 1986 by federal appeals judge Gerald W. Haney. And Haney concluded, when all is said and done, a few simple but very important facts remain. The case introduced to, the case, the casing introduced into evidence had been extracted from the Wichita AR-15. In his 1999 memoir, Pem Peltier admitted that he had fired at the agents but denies that he fired the fatal shots that killed them. Uh, well, the agents really shouldn't have been on the, the land in the first place for any reason. And you know when the FBI comes into BIA and federal land, you know that it's for self-agenda reasons. And I mean, I don't think I have to go into and assume the racism that ensues, or and especially ensued in that era in America in the 1970s, you know. Um, basically, I'm sure that the majority of FBI agents are outside law enforcement and not familiar with a particular tribe. They have the mindset that those members and those souls on that reservation are, you know, maybe subhuman or not as good as them. But, you know, I think anybody with half a brain can kind of figure that out. And, you know, if you think I'm assuming, well, that that's your issue. But generally, that's the case. Um, so the, the cartridge the, the cartridge case from the Wichita AR-15 was found in the trunk of Agent Collier's car and admitted as evidence as Peltier's trial in Fargo, North, North Dakota. Also admitted as evidence was the fact that no person involved in shooting at the agents other than Peltier possessed an AR-15 rifle. 
Um, journalist Scott Anderson said in a 1995 interview that Peltier, that uh, in an interview with Peltier, he sought answers to the contradictions that he had found in Peltier's accounts of the incident when asked about the gun he carried that day. Peltier had listed um, s several different um, different caliber guns, but he did not remember the AR-15. Uh, former 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 United States Attorney General Rams General Ramsey Clark had served pro bono as one of Peltier's lawyers, and has aided in filing a series of appeals on Peltier's behalf. In all appeals, the conviction and sentence have been affirmed by the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. The last two appeals um, were Peltier versus Henneman. Uh, 997F.2D461 in July of 1993 and United States v. Peltier 446F.3D911 in the 8th Circuit Court 2006. Um, some of the doubts about legal proceedings. Um, numerous doubts have been raised over Peltier's guilt over the years and the fairness of his trial based on allegations and inconsistencies, of course, with the FBI's prosecution and handling of the case. Huh, that's surprising. Um, FBI radio intercepts indicated that two FBI agents had been pursuing a red pickup truck. This was confirmed by the FBI the day after the shootout. Red pickup trucks, red pickup trucks near the reservation were stopped for weeks. But Leonard Peltier did not drive a red pickup truck. Evidence was given that Peltier was driving a suburban vehicle, a lar which of course is a large style station wagon for those who don't know. Um, it, and this was built on top of a pickup truck chassis, which enclosed with an enclosed rear section. Peltier's vehicle was actually red with a white roof, not a red open tray pickup truck with no white paint. The FBI agent's radioed message said that they had suspected they were pursuing driving that they were pursued driving a red truck with no additional details, just a red pickup truck. Okay, and at Peltier's trial, the FBI testified that it had been searching for a red and a white van. Uh, okay, that that that's right there. That's that's you know that's a little bit suspicious, quite a bit, if you ask me. Um, which Peltier, of course, was seen sometimes driving that red and white van, okay, which we know that's documented, not the red pickup truck the FBI radioed in about. Um, you know, and of course, even in the, even in the racist court system uh, of those times, that was a highly contentious matter for, of evidence in the trials. You know, testimony from three witnesses placed Peltier, Robideau, and Butler near the crime scene. Those three witnesses later recanted, alleging that the FBI, well, while extracting their testimony, had tied them to chairs, denying their right, denying them rights to talk to a lawyer, and otherwise coerced and threatened them. Robideau said in an interview with the, with the Robert Redford, Michael App. Apted film incident at Ogala in 1992 that we approached the agent's car. Unlike the juries and similar prosecutions against AIM leaders at the time, the Fargo jury were not allowed to hear about other cases in which the FBI had been rebuked or tampering with evidence and witnesses. See, this is ridiculous right here. This is why this man, this is why this man deserves not just another trial, this man deserves to be pardoned. Um, he deserves a few million dollars, I'd say $10 million, $20 million for the time and the suffering that his family has went through. Um, and I'm calling on, it's, I think it's a shame that neither President Carter, Reagan, Bush Sr., Clinton, Bush Jr., or Obama have um, pardoned this man. It's time to send a message and pardon this guy. Now, Obama... You know, he's still got a nine months or so left in his presidency, and maybe that's something he'll do, although I doubt it. But this is why it's important. Um, you know, something that I'd want to ask Bernie Sanders and Will uh, when I go to his rally, if and when he does make it out here to Oregon, um, I will ask him to take a look at the Leonard Peltier case and to really, really give it a good look over and, you know, see what he thinks. And I know that, you know, There'll be pressure from, you know, the FBI and things like that not to, you know, he shot two men. Well, 
it was a hundred years ago for one and two the evidence is sh shoddy and shady and I think that any FBI agent that would that would disagree with this is kind of you know it just shows it speaks to their racism core not understanding the fact of how the culture was back then and how you know profiling it was done to all sorts of minorities and you know of course uh, first and foremost really Native American Indians so the profiling is really ridiculous um, you know and it just it, it just it, go, it goes on and on and on and on and on from there you know, um, there's contradictions here and there and everywhere. And it just seems to me that at the very beginning, you know, you take a look at those transmissions from the FBI and describing Peltier's vehicle, which wasn't Peltier's vehicle. Um, it just seems to me that that's enough right there that should get it thrown out of court. But really, that should have been thrown out of court. And he should not have that doesn't this is the real way that you know it was a screw job his two associates were acquitted but but because Peltier was not extradited from Canada yet and could not be tried with those two he was tried separately okay and found guilty tried separately and found guilty okay that's you know even though that's another person to me that's almost like double jeopardy and the fact that certain evidence was not allowed in the case and other evidence was it's just it, it it speaks to the hypocrisy of our justice system too there's no evidence that should not be allowed into a case i mean if i'm a juror on a case i don't care what that person's being tried for you better goddamn well have video camera footage or testimony beyond any kind of belief that you'll ever see in a normal trial for me to vote to convict that's just how I am I'd rather see one guilty I'd rather see a hundred thousand nasty guilty people go free than one person falsely accused and imprisoned and le the Leonard Peltier story just it breaks my heart and it has for years and it's just a goddamn outrage you know in the prison system in our country is an outrage you know we spend more we have more people locked up in the United States than any other industrialized country that includes China and Russia as well Okay, we have more people in prisons than we have. We have more people, young people, minority young people, especially in prisons than we do um, in college or with, you know, decent jobs. And the thing is, most of it is drug related. Um, we could really curb most of this by legalizing all drugs, which would take care of all the problem. You wouldn't have the robbery. You wouldn't have the crimes. Um, the drugs would cost about one twentieth of what they do now um, if they weren't completely taxed to death by the government and um, so you would see all these so plus the drugs would be clean they wouldn't be dirty down and cut with all kinds of shit um, you're never gonna stop the problem once there, where there's a supply there's a demand but what happens when you legalize and there's a couple other countries that have done this that have went to legalizing all drugs or decriminalizing all drugs and what you find is that almost in a matter of a few years um, the drug use rate completely just plummets okay it takes the wow factor out of it crime goes way down because people that choose to still use these drugs um, they have them really cheap they they use them um, they they keep to their own they stay out of people's business and you know they do their they do their thing and they you know no harm no foul okay as long as it's not hurting anybody else what you're doing Right, and I mean physically, not just, you know, some emotional bullshit. I mean physically hurting somebody else or imposing your will on somebody else. It's none of your business what that person does, period. Even if the sky was going to fall if you legalized all the drugs, which it wouldn't, all it would do is piss off the pharmaceutical companies and save us a bunch of money from hiring all these prison guards working for private prisons and all these narcotics agents. So also, what you have in these prisons, I want to tell you what goes on. A friend of mine, older friend of mine that lived in the neighborhood when I was growing up, um, you know, he went to prison for six years, a federal prison, got out a few years ago. And what people need to understand is it's very inhumane. These people are locked up for 23 hours a day, made to wear these fucking stupid suits. They're not allowed. The prison guards are real you know military like and you know they talk down to the prisoners and the prisoners aren't even really allowed to look at them in the eye when they're being talked to um, they also this is this is the kicker here um, if you have to have a root canal done or any teeth pulled in there 
um, this is what you get. You don't get any Novocaine to shoot. You don't get any pain pills. You don't get any Novocaine to even numb your mouth while they do it. They give you one 800 milligram ibuprofen or a Tylenol. That's it. And some of these people also, for medical issues, they're hurting. You know, they've got issues going on. They're in such severe pain and they're given Tylenol and sent back to their cell. You know, and some of the people that end up dying in there that doesn't have any family to come claim them, they'll just take them and throw them away out in the woods. It's true. I mean, this stuff's all true. I mean, I, I know this for a fact in talking to a few people that I really completely trust and stories I've heard. It's true. And we need to get out of that mentality of locking people up and get rid of the industrial prison complex. Just like I always talk about the military industrial complex. We have a prison complex that likes to lock people up in this country. Okay, and we've got still citizens that want to enforce their will onto people and make this law and that law, and which, which each law, while somewhat good intention for some people, it creates a thousand more laws. So let's get out of the, the, the business of jailing people and let's get into the business of taking care of them and being our brother's you know, helper, not his keeper. Um, it's just ridiculous. In my opinion, I'm pretty radical when it comes to this shit. I think all drugs should be legal. Prostitution, gambling should be legal. It takes the crime element out of it. It's logical. Um, the, the way we've been doing it now doesn't work. So even if I was completely wrong, I'm not because the way we do it doesn't work and hasn't worked and is only going to get worse if we keep going down this road as you see society decline decade after decade after decade in the United States because of these fucking draconian laws that set up a system like that where everything's bought off, paid off, private this, private that, okay, corrupt government officials. It, it's just, it's really... It's really sickening and disheartening, and people really should be outraged at that because that does go on. I mean, people are given Tylenol in prison for like painkillers after surgery, okay? No, you know, and practically no anesthesia, no uh, Novocaine for major, de major dental work, okay? An 800 milligram ibuprofen. Okay, yeah, gee, wow. That's mighty nice of them to give out that. Um, and the way that they're treated, there's no education in there. There's no, it's just ridiculous. And in my opinion too, like I said about how radical I am, I don't think anybody should be locked up period for nonviolent crimes. I don't care if it's fraud. I don't care if it's this or if it's that. It's just not humane to do. Now a child molester, a serial killer, something like that, yes. Should they be separated from the public? You goddamn right they should be, okay? But at the same time, there's no reason to treat them like that in prison either. There's no reason at all. The main reason that you want to do is get these people away and out of out from society so they can harm people, all right? But you don't treat them and be humane. You don't stoop to their level and treat them unhumane like they're less of a human being when they're incarcerated, okay? People need to just awaken and get out of that emotional eye for an eye type of a mentality in the way they act and think. You know, now... Then again, too, okay, if, if somebody was to molest your child or kill your kill, kill a family member of yours, at the same time, hey, if in between the time that they get arrested and get put away, if, you know, in between that time, somebody takes a shot at them and does them in, a family member, hey, I'm not going to put that family member on trial. Okay, it's temporary insanity, and I would leave it at that without even putting them on trial, you know, so long as... So long as that was the person that committed the crime. Now, if they acted hastily and did that to somebody who it turns out was innocent, yeah, unfortunately, then we're going to have a problem with that person. Even, even though what they went through and they did it out of just a quick emotion, we're still going to have to have an issue with that person. Okay, so it, these things need to be taken by a case-by-case -case basis. No law is going to fix everything because it creates a thousand more laws. It's a lazy way of doing things. Okay, and when we get more involved with our community and embrace each other and embrace our cultural differences and love our cultural differences and share and trade them with each other, okay, the more we do that, the more of a freer society we're going to become, especially, you know, consciously. We're just, it's just going to happen. Um, the corruptness is rampant, but it starts with getting involved, okay? Like with the Peltier case, it starts with getting involved and getting mad as hell and asking politicians about this. Yeah, I know what a lot of people might be thinking. Oh, he's just a 71-year-old man. He's just one guy. Oh, that case is old and settled. And done. Bullshit. That's one man who is a good man who's suffering, okay? He's suffering. 
His suffering is more of an issue than a thousand people's happiness, okay? He's suffering. I mean, even if you even if you thought for a fact this guy was guilty, look at the little small details in this case and the hypocrisy. One of those alone, one of those alone is enough doubt not to not to send somebody away for murder. My God. Come on, people. It's time to call out the FBI and it's time to, you know, it's time to call out presidential candidates over this issue. You know, I'm just giving my two cents worth. Nobody will probably listen. But that's the way I feel about it. You know, Leonard deserves at least to live out a few years of his life in peace. You know what I mean? He's 71 years old now. Let's 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 hurry up and get with it. It's not going to happen through parole or through, uh, you know, his release. I mean, his release is not for another 24 years. He'll be 96 years old. His next parole hearing is not for another eight years. You know, Jesus, he'll be 79, almost 80 years old then. Okay, and you know they're not going to parole him in 2024 because they, see, there's a code of kind of criminality, comedy between cops, prison guards, federal agents. It's like one of theirs. Oh, you shot one of theirs. Well, if those would have been two citizens that were accidentally shot that were involved in this situation, Peltier probably would have already been uh, paroled and maybe, maybe for sure in 2024 at least paroled. But it's not going to happen in 2024, okay? It's only going to happen when some president has the balls has the balls and the moxie to do the right thing on their way out of office. I hoped Clinton, I thought Clinton might do it back then. I knew Dum I knew George Dumio wouldn't do it, of course. You know, duh, that would have, nothing really surprises me, but that would have been, that would have been the shock of all time if George W. Bush would have done it. But maybe by some miracle of a chance, Obama will consider it. I think it's worth throwing the question out to him if anybody's ever has a chance to hear him speak if he does anymore speaking anywhere and they can hear me talking throw that question of Leonard Peltier out to him you know I'm definitely I'm definitely going to throw it out to Bernie Sanders I'm going to try my very best to get that thrown out there to him so I just want to also wish everybody much love out there again uh, much love especially to the Windhorse Circle of Rainbow Warriors group, Greg Stout and Cheryl Ingalls, Eagle Rainbows. Sorry, I said Cheryl Ingle almost. I used to work with a lady named Cheryl Ingle. <laughs> so every time I see Cheryl's name on there, I think of Cheryl Ingle. But Cheryl Eagle Rainbows, Eagle's Rainbow. And I apologize for being all over the place. I, I've been really wanting to do this talk for a long time, and I was really nervous. And, you know, I, I hope it sounds okay. And know that my heart and my love was in the right place and much love to everybody out there and with that i'll give everybody a big cosmic dating game kiss goodbye and free leonard peltier Mwah.